Welcome back, geology fans. A quick search on the internet through creationist land will give you all kinds of arguments against the validity of radiometric dating as we described in our last episode. You can find that dinosaur bone and wood fragments that are, according to us geologists, millions of years old have radiocarbon dates to mere thousands of years old. Or there's the rock collected from Mount St. Helens, which we know formed in 1980, but it dates up to three million years old. So, how can we trust radiometric dating? We start by not trusting people who start with a foregone conclusion and thus get selective about which evidence they bring forward and how accurate it is. In my experience, young earth creationists are out on this account. So how do I answer the nonsense online? We start by realizing that there are assumptions involved with radiometric dating which must be satisfied for it to work, and thus we must be selective in which materials we date. The first assumption is that the sample is closed with respect to parent and daughter. If any parent leaks in or daughter leaks out, the sample will read younger than its actual age, and if the parent leaks out or the daughter leaks in, it'll appear older than it is. One of the Institute for Creation Research's favorite examples of the fallibility of radiometric dating is to say that they found carbon-14 in diamonds, and that with the supposed geologic age of the diamond, there should be none, unless you take into account contamination of the sample. Parent most likely leaked into the sample during the preparation process that would give a false reading. Carbon-14 travels with groundwater and can end up in all kinds of materials such as dinosaur bone or wood and thus give a false reading. With the isochron dating method we will discuss today, we will see that we can test that this closed system assumption has been met. The second assumption is that we know the relative amount of parent and daughter in the sample at its formation. In our last episode, I indicated that you started with 100% parent and 0% daughter to make the calculations easy. Fortunately, there are some systems that do just that. When a case-bar crystal forms, it can't take any argon into the crystal lattice as argon is an unreactive noble gas. But there's plenty of potassium-40 in a potassium feldspar, so the initial ratio is 100% potassium-40 and 0% argon-40. Uranium at the surface gets oxidized to uroxyl, which is soluble in water, and lithophobic, meaning it does not want to precipitate out as a solid unless it has to or is greatly encouraged. But the daughter of uranium, thorium, is just the opposite, hating to be in solution and binding into a solid state rapidly. Thus, if a sample, such as a coral or a stalagmite in a cave, were to form from precipitation of material in an aqueous solution, it will start with 100% uranium and 0% thorium. Is all hope lost if we can't say for sure that we started with 100% parent and 0% daughter? Again, we will find answers in isochron dating. But on to our third assumption, which is that the half-life of these parent-daughter pairs are constant. The clock needs to tick at a constant rate, which experiment and theory says it will, unless we reach relativistic speeds or colossal gravity wells and we don't think the Earth has had any issues to worry about there during its existence. But you could reach critical mass and start a chain reaction which speeds up the decay process and thus shortens the half-life. There are a couple of natural nuclear reactors chain reacting in the world, but we don't use them for dating. You're very safe in assuming that a uh, rock that you find will probably have a constant half-life for each of its decaying isotopes, which can be checked against each other as well. The last assumption is that your rock is not too young, so that the amount of daughter that has been produced is so small that it is under the error bars of the mass spectrometer machines measuring these isotopes. This is the main and known reason the Institute for Creation Research found carbon-14 in a diamond. The machine was helping to put out a false positive through ion drift. It couldn't tell the difference between very little carbon-14 and no carbon-14. The Institute for Creation Research has decided this means there was definitely carbon-14. And they may also point out that rock from Mount St. Helens that was up to 3 million years old. The rock was collected after eruption and tested about 11 years later by potassium-argon dating, and with a half-life of 1.28 billion years, not much potassium had turned to argon in those 11 years. 
As it turns out, they used a lab whose error range for potassium-argon dating was 3 million years. Now, if we use this method properly, and on a truly old rock, say 100 million years old, 3 million year error is not too bad and gets you in the range. But for an 11 year old rock, that's a pretty huge error. So, the creationists tell us this rock is being reported as up to 3 million years old, but they forgot to mention that it could also have formed from up to 3 million years in the future. Pretty magical rock there, creationists. The real story here is there was not enough daughter to test for accurately. Conversely, to the rock not being too young, it also can't be too old, as once you get past six or seven half-lives, you don't even have enough parent material left. At seven half-lives, you only have 0.78% of the parent material left, and that is often within the error bars of our labs. So why would a creationist bother radiocarbon dating a dinosaur bone when radiocarbon leaks into the bone and only has a half-life of 5,730 years? Six half-lives only adds up to 34,380 years before C14 has decayed below detectable limits. More sophisticated clean labs can get error bars down and pull out seven half-lives, eight, get back around 40,000 years old. I recently worked on a dig in Snowmass, Colorado, where wood samples came out looking as fresh as if they had just came off the tree, but they were radiocarbon dead. There was no carbon-14 in them at all, as no groundwater could make it through the clay and silt protecting the samples. They could not get contaminated. They were a closed system. And thus we knew the fossils were older than 40,000 years old. As you need some kind of carbon sample with no carbon-14 to use as a blank to calibrate your mass spectrometer doing these measurements, it is rumored that this very wood could be used as a superior blank and perhaps take dating back to maybe eight half-lives or around 50,000 years. By recognizing these assumptions and limitations to what we can date, we can put time spikes where datable rocks occur. But let's return to the issue that we need to know the amount of parent and daughter initially in the material. I said that through isochron dating we can find that out, so what is isochron dating, you ask? Instead of using our machines to only measure the amount of parent and daughter isotopes, we also measure another isotope of the same element as the daughter product. But it has to be a stable isotope, with no parent material forming it, and it is not decaying to be the parent of another material. So we do this because the ratio of daughter product to the stable doppelganger is a constant in a chemical mix to begin with. Let's use rubidium-87 to strontium-87, and also measure stable strontium-86. We then make a plot, and on the y-axis we use the ratio of daughter to the stable flavor of its element. So in this case we plot strontium-87 to strontium-86. At this point, no matter what we plot on the x-axis, the plot will either be a point or points along a horizontal line, as the daughter to stable isotope ratio is a constant value to begin with. But we are going to assign to the x-axis the ratio of our parent isotope to that stable third party. So here we use rubidium-87 over strontium-86. If all minerals started with the same mix, we would get a single point, but nature is messy, and you could start with an unknown ratio of parent to daughter, and each mineral in the rock would end up with a formation starting with a different amount of rubidium-87, and this means that we'll get those points on a flat horizontal line for a newly formed rock. But now we start the clock. And let's say we go through a single half-life, which would be remarkable as the half-life of rubidium is up to almost 49 billion years. But follow for argument's sake. This lowest concentration of rubidium over here will have and convert that lost rubidium to strontium-87. So the point moves up and to the left a bit. This next sample with more rubidium also goes to half, but half of a larger initial amount means more rubidium atoms have turned to more strontium-87 than in our previous point, and so we move even more up and to the left. And so it goes to the higher initial rubidium values, each progressively moving more up and to the left. This results in the points laying on a line. At least they should be on a predictable line, or we know the system was not closed with respect to parent and or daughter. 
So there is how we use the isochron plot to test for closure. But this line gives us another piece of information. How much time has actually passed? If we were to go through a second half-life, the points would end up here, and a third half-life would bring us to here. The slope of the line is a function of the amount of time that has passed. A flat line is a brand new rock, and a steep line is an older rock. Some isotopes are very useful with metamorphic rocks of varying types, but with the heat and pressure of metamorphism, we have to be very careful about keeping our system closed to parent and daughter. This means you can't use the potassium-argon system to get the original age of a metamorphic rock, but maybe you could use the uranium-lead system for that. Uh, check the, some isochrons to test for closure, and then realize that a metamorphic event that releases its fluids will dump all the argon from its system and reset the potassium argon clock. There are cases where we can get the age of the original parent rock and then the age at which it was metamorphosed. Sedimentary rocks are a bit harder to use and it's nearly impossible for clastic sedimentary rocks as each piece of the rock is its own age, but some chemically precipitated sedimentary rocks like our previously mentioned corals and stalagmites can be dated mainly by the uranium thorium system. The best rock type for radiometric dating, though, are the igneous rocks. The atoms crystallize from the magma or lava in an orderly and predictable way from a fairly uniform chemical mixture. A good lava flow in the middle of a sedimentary stack can tell you its age, and superposition tells you everything below the lava flow is older than that age, and everything above is younger. Better still, a volcanic ash layer, which covers an even larger area than a lava flow, uh, can easily be dated. If I find a layer of volcanic ash in a sedimentary stack, I have just found a time spike which constrains the ages of the rocks above and below. And it is such volcanic material which informs most of the time spikes we see in the official geologic time scale. And the reason some of these periods and era boundaries get shifted is new time spikes are found and new constraints on ages emerge. And how satisfying is it that when we use the rules of relative age dating and put all our rock formations in proper order, as was already happening before this technology developed, and then look at the radiometric dates within, the dates fall in proper sequence. The story of an ancient earth of deep time is very compelling. When we come back next time, we will look at some of the other methods we can use, besides radiometric dating as we've described it so far, which can give absolute ages of material and support the concept of a greatly ancient planet, here on Earth Explorations. <laughs>